Thank you all for coming. I'm happy to say and proud to say that not only am I a AAAS member, but also I am a, an alum of the AAAS Mass Media Science Fellows Program. Uh, 1981, I dare say, when the program was young. I was 12 years old, of course. And um, that program uh, has been absolutely instrumental in affecting and, and uh, influencing my ability to communicate with the public, which has been quite important with my research subject, sharks. Shark research has been around at least since Aristotle, 330 BC. Aristotle discussed the reproductive systems of sharks and noted how similar they were to mammals. Modern shark research started around the mid 20th century, and I still hear today my colleagues saying, uh, well, we really don't know much about sharks. Well, we've been studying them for 2,300 years. <laughs> if we don't know anything still, we got some explaining to do. I, th I think we know quite a bit at this point. I'd like to, to show you some of the things that, that we're learning. So um, we know sharks appeared in, in the uh, in vertebrate evolution more than 400 million years ago. Uh, we know that they're now represented by about 500 extant species of, um, of sharks in about, in, in eight orders and 34 families. Um, that sharks inhabit not just warm water, but tropical, subtropical, temperate, and even polar uh, areas. They go into marine brackish and freshwater um, habitats. There are swimming sharks, there are bottom living sharks, there are sharks live along the coastline, in the upper ocean, and in the deep sea. And as far as size, they range from the small shark that can fit in the palm of your hand as an adult, lives in the deep sea, to the world's largest fish, the largest fish that's ever existed as far as we know, the whale shark, which gets to be in excess of 13 meters long. On the left there, this is a molecular phylogeny that's recently been done of, of most of the shark species that shows those eight orders. Uh, and this was using data from GenBank and the uh, barcoding of life project. So new technology is, is giving us new insights into the biology of these animals. On the right, uh, the authors showed eight examples of species from these eight families. And you can see uh, a diversity of, of shape and size and, and form. So they don't all look like this, <laughs> despite what the Discovery Channel would, <laughs> would lead you to believe and what the public uh, thinks quite often. So I'm gonna highlight uh, five areas of shark research and um, some things that are recent, I think they're interesting. And I'm calling this from the inside out, starting with genetic level and working our way out to, to ecology. Uh, first, in, in genomics, uh, sharks recently have been shown to be capable of parthenogenesis, virgin birth where the females can give birth to viable young without the help of a male, which I think my wife sometimes understands that, <laughs> that, that I shouldn't be involved in those things. But uh, Damien Chapman, who's now at Stony Brook, uh, documented this first in two aquaria, uh, one in Omaha, Nebraska, and the other one in Virginia Beach. And it's recently the shark on the bottom there. This was a recent report from an aquarium in Dubai. And basically, female sharks that are in aquaria that are without the presence of males uh, have been given um, or are capable of this parthenogenesis. Uh, this is three different families in this case. So before we knew that all the vertebrate classes were capable of this, but sharks and mammals, now sharks are, are part of this as well. Also, sort of hot off the presses, um, and actually still on the AAAS website, is the first case of hybrids being found in sharks in the wild, hybrids between uh, two different species. And you can read about it at, on the website. And this has implications for evolution, has implications probably for conservation biology, but those implications are still, um, still remain to be uh, clarified. So moving up to immunology. Uh, this book came out 20 years ago, 1992. It's wrong, okay? <laughs> for a lot of reasons uh, that I can't go into, but uh, sharks do get cancer extremely rarely though, only about a dozen cases of malignant tumors from sharks uh, in the National Registry of Tumors. Why this is has been the subject of, of research for a number of decades, uh, but currently workers actually at the Moat Marine Lab uh, who work on this have discovered that the immune cells of sharks, and we don't know whether it's the granulocytes or the lymphocytes, 
produce uh, substances, proteinaceous substances, which actually attack malignant cells, which bind with malignant cells prefer preferentially and uh, turn on apoto apoptosis, which is, the, which is programmed cell death. So uh, you can see the results of some of their work here, uh, cells that have uh, control on this side and cells that have been exposed to the media. The breast carcinoma cells, the malignant cells, are pretty much wiped out. Uh, the, the normal cells, not so much. And here's the difference in the activity level. So this is very exciting work. And uh, what it means for the shark itself is unclear, but it certainly has a great application for human therapies. Moving to the outside of the shark, shark skin. Uh, you probably know that shark skin is very rough, and it's uh, composed of um, many of these minute scales called dermal denticles. They're little teeth that point toward the back of the shark uh, and they have these ridges on them. Uh, we've always thought that uh, shark scales were important in terms of uh, protection for the animal, like a suit of armor against injury and against parasites. But the recent, recent research on the hydrodynamics of this skin is, is revealing some new wrinkles in that not only are these ribs that go down the denticles important uh, in water flow, but also the fact that the, the denticles are not fixed like a plate of armor, but in fact it can move. They flex or they bristle. And this is work by uh, Amy Lang, an engineer at the University of Alabama, and Phil Moda at the University of South Florida. Okay, why, why is this important? Well, this is a, uh, a graphic of uh, laser optic view of <clears throat> the movement of, of water through a tank across a surface. And you'll see that as the water goes across the surface, it encounters drag, and you see a backflow of, of particles uh, here in eddies and so on. When that happens to a body moving through water, uh, it slows it down. It makes it less efficient. So it, it's important for organisms, and it's important for even man-made objects, to try to eliminate what's called this flow separation. And what you're looking at now, then, is actually the skin of a mako shark looking down on it right here. And you can see the individual scales. And water is moving across. And those eddies that were created uh, as the water moves across are actually going underneath the scale. The scale is passively lifting. And it resists the, the flow separation that engineers say would, would uh, slow the animals down. So this is a tremendous hydrodynamic uh, adaptation that makes, them, makes the animals not only faster, but more maneuverable. And I just think it's, I think it's incredible. And this is a very new finding. Moving to behavior, um, the fine scale behavior of sharks is now being examined in new ways. And if, you're, if you get the theme of my talk, it's all about the tools that we have, the technology. Uh, a, a new kind of an instrument called an accelerometer, the thing that's in your, in your camera, in your iPhone, and uh, in, in your Wii uh, remote control, measures movement in three planes. And this is Nick Whitney at our lab who works uh, with these devices and attaches them to sharks. And the kind of data that he gets uh, from these kinds of deployments looks like this. And you see a lot of squiggles and all kinds of things going on here. Um, you see sharks that are resting. You see sharks that are swimming actively, and so on and so forth. You can see when the animal's head is down, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, why is this, why is this interesting? Well. If we're looking at behaviors that we've had a real hard time trying to observe in the wild, such as mating, and this is two sharks mating, uh, two nurse sharks mating in the shallows off the Florida Keys, you see that in this case the female is turned upside down. And yes, sharks do mate like mammals, thus that's what Aristotle uh, discovered himself. Uh, so accelerometry data coming back from animals that uh, have been tagged with these devices can tell us when and where these animals are mating in a way that we never could get before because of how difficult it is to observe them in the wild. Well, moving into a little bit larger scale, uh, long distance migrations, movements, uh, we now use a variety of tools, uh, satellite tracking devices like this little one I have here. Um, and these are, um, devices that record light which, from which we get position. They record temperature and depth. And we can attach these to sharks, release them, and now be able to see the individual movements of the animals uh, through long periods of time. 
This is a bull shark that we've actually been tracking in our lab for eight months. Uh, we, we tagged it off of uh, southwest coast of Florida, it moved up here, and now it's spending its winter in the Bahamas and off of Cuba. <laughs> and it's still reporting back to us uh, in, in a way that we could never, never uh, see before, going back about 10 or 15 years. Many, uh, many different labs are using this technology, not only for sharks, but many different kinds of marine animals. Uh, this is a, a track of a tiger shark that shows, um, and this is work by uh, Mahmoud Shivji and Brad Weatherby. Uh, this shows the connectivity between the island of Bermuda, off in the middle of the Northwest Atlantic, and the Bahamas. As this animal roams about the ocean, goes back to the Bahamas again in the, in the wintertime, uh, and then heads back to, to Bermuda. So these are things that we speculated about in the past, that we had fisheries and catch data on, but never before were we able to look at the sort of the private lives of these animals in this kind of way. I've worked uh, down off the Yucatan Peninsula for a number of years on this species, uh, the whale shark, and I've had, some, I've had some pretty special company at times. Sylvia Earle was down there with us in 2005. This is a, an area where whale sharks come together in, in great numbers to feed. Uh, it's the as I said, the largest shark, the largest fish that's ever existed. I think it's probably the largest animal that you can get this close to and not be at any risk. Uh, I'm talking about the shark here, not, not me. <laughs> I'm the ugly one on the left. And they come together from May through September in this, in this spot in incredible numbers, a uh, species that is vulnerable, but we think is actually doing fairly well in this part of the world. Fortunately, they're not fished. And I don't know if you can see that. That's an aerial shot from about 1,000 feet. They look like tadpoles there. Hundreds of them feed, and we published on this recently. I think we think as many as 1,400 come to this area during the summertime. Well, we've tagged many, many whale sharks with satellite tags <clears throat> and seen movements all over the, the Gulf and the Caribbean. But this is the most dramatic movement. This was a mature uh, female that we thought was pregnant at the time, and she moved down through the Caribbean over five months and ended up off the mid-Atlantic, near the mid-Atlantic Ridge, just, uh, just south of the equator. And we named her Rio Lady for, for obvious reasons, since she went off Brazil. So down here, this is, this is very interesting to us, and we wouldn't have been able to know this without satellite tag technology. Uh, the interesting part is that the Brazilian scientists working in this very remote area have reported seeing little tiny whale sharks swim, free swimming in that spot, so it's apparently, we think this is a, a clue that this may be where whale sharks in the Atlantic are going to give birth to their pups, something we've not known before. Uh, not only do they travel great distances, but they dive to extreme depths, um, almost 2,000 meters, um, and uh, we're probably deeper, but our tags come off before they're crushed. So this is, this is I think, the record, 1,928 meters of a shark that we tagged uh, two uh, Aprils ago off of um, off Louisiana and, and some work we were doing with the effect of the oil spill on, on whale sharks. So why they do this is, is subject of, of our research now. I can talk to you at the reception about that if you're interested. Finally, ecology. Sharks are apex predators. Not all, but most of the species. Uh, and they tend to be, as, as seen here in this food web diagram, at the the, the top of the web, well, not quite the top, because we're at the top of the web, uh, if you put in people. And so the, the role that sharks have played in, in e ecology and ecosystems has been pretty much theoretical up until recently, with recent advances, uh, including this paper, a number of others, we've now been able to tease out what it, the, the role that sharks play in that being top predators, they're involved with balance of the mesopredators or carnivores below them that affects the, the herbivore level and all the way down to the primary producers. And this was a paper actually that, that my friend Nancy was a co-author on, where they looked at four places in the Pacific um, Islands and four reef systems, uh, one of which was uh, sort of a natural situation with lots of shark predators. <laughs> Uh, and then all the way down to an overfish situation where the sharks had been pretty much removed. And you see what happens, that the coral, the live coral cover, 
is declining, and what's increasing is algae covering over the reef. And so here's the nice healthy reef with lots of sharks, and you work your way down here, and here's what amounts to a nearly dead reef. So removing sharks from this ecosystem uh, can actually end up choking the reef itself through cascading ecological effects. So we're engaged, as, as many of us are these days, in a race against time. Yes, we have new cutting edge technology that's uh, giving us new insights into, into shark biology, but we have large conservation issues uh, that Nancy mentioned, and the future of shark, a lot of shark populations is in doubt. People are simply um, removing sharks from the world's oceans faster than we can study them. Uh, Shelley Clark at the Imperial, Imperial College London estimated uh, a few years ago that the fins of between 26 and 73 million sharks are entering the, the world's shark fin trade every year. And the IUCN has estimated that about 30% of pelagic shark species are threatened with extinction. So we who know sharks, who appreciate them for their biological, their economic, and even their aesthetic value, are committed to a future with sharks. So, um, we, and we are committed to that future, not only because we want to study them, but beca because they do play a vital role in a healthy ocean. So thank you very much.